having something of an inside scoop on the sermon today, I know that it is going to be built mostly on the psalm. So uh, if you would open your bulletin insert, please. And you'll see the first reading, Acts, and then the second reading is actually Psalm 1. And let's read this together. Psalm 1 together. Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seats of the scornful. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on God's law day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season, with leaves that do not wither. Everything they do shall prosper. It is not so with the wicked. They are like chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked shall not stand upright when judgment comes, nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked is due. Our gospel reading today comes from the Gospel of John, in which we've been reading for the last several weeks, and there we continue. Jesus prayed for his disciples, saying, I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you, for the words that you gave me I have given to them, and they have received them and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I'm asking on their behalf, I'm not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I've been glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost except the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I don't belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. For their sakes, I sanctify myself, so that they also may be sanctified in truth. Let us pray. Lord, we do thank you for the gift of your word, and we pray that it is your word that would be spoken uh, through our preacher this morning, and we do ask this all for your love's precious sake. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, St. Matthews. Good morning. Oh, wait, I have to turn my microphone on. All right. Sorry, I almost forgot. You guys look gorgeous this morning. You look beautiful in your hats and bright colors. So honored to be here with you all. For those of you who do not know me, I'm Christine. I'm Father Rob's daughter. Um, and I am so grateful to have the opportunity to preach to you guys this morning. So thank you for having me. So, um, as you guys know, sermons are usually on the gospel, but they can be on the other readings as well. And today, I really wanted to talk about Psalm 1 because I love the Psalms. The Psalms are one of my favorite books of the Bible because I feel that they really do an amazing job of capturing the entire breadth of the human experience, both the highs and the lows, and um, the richness and the breadth of the human relationship with God, both individually and communally. And so one of the people who has helped me read the Psalms uh, most uh, richly is an Old Testament scholar by the name of Walter Brueggemann. I don't know if you guys have heard him. He's done a lot of research and writing on the Psalms and on the Old Testament, and he's, he's great. Highly recommend him. Um, so he recommends reading the Psalms through a lens of orientation, disorientation, and reorientation. Um, and so let me break down a little bit of what that, that means. So essentially, Psalms of orientation teach uh, what we call in psychology a just world worldview. So this is the idea that evil is punished and good is rewarded. There's no tension to resolve in these psalms. Psalm 1 is actually an orientation psalm. So you can see here the psalm is talking about the wicked blowing away like chaff on the wind and the righteous flourish like trees by water. Um, 
So basically, good people get good things and bad people get bad things. However, anyone who's read the Psalms know that just as this uh, Psalm 1 is talking about bad people getting bad things, there's also Psalms of lament and petition, crying out to God, why are the wicked prospering? Why are you letting the wicked hurt me in this way? And why are the, richest, the righteous suffering? And so these are the Psalms of disorientation. And Brueggemann describes, states that these are ways of entering linguistically into a new distressful situation in which the old situation has collapsed. So again, these are those Psalms of lament, of petition, of protest, where individuals and communities cry out to God for the suffering they have endured. And finally, we get to psalms of reorientation. So these include thanksgiving hymns, celebrating a newness that has been given rather than achieved, not automatic and not derived from the old, but is rather a genuine newness wrought by gift. So Psalm 1 frames the entire Psalter. It's a frame of orientation. It orients us. Um, there is a simple, clear moral tale here. The wicked will suffer and the righteous will be rewarded. And it sets the stage for the psalms of disorientation and reorientation to come, where this natural order of things shall be upset and the psalmist will wrestle with seemingly senseless suffering. However, before this dismantling of order crashes over us like a wave, Psalm 1 first orients us in the blessings of the Lord as a way of understanding where we come from, what we desire, how much will be lost, before we are reoriented to God's new reality. So I want you to keep this frame of orientation, disorientation, reorientation in mind as I tell this next story. So as some of you may know, I went to seminary in Southern California. Uh, and so a little while ago, I was going to church with a friend of mine. It was not my usual church. It was an evening tenebrae service. Um, and at this point in my life, I was feeling very burned out and beaten down, to put it simply. <laughs> and there's a lot of different reasons for that. Um, you know, the pressures of grad school, ruptures in my relationships, my community. Um, one of my best friends was getting a divorce at the time that was really impacting my graduate school cohort. Um, so that was really hard. Um, and just what was going on in society and politics at that time, you know, felt very stressful and, and just, very negative, and I, I'm sure anyone on either side of the political spectrum can relate to that. Um, and there was just very little spiritual connection I was feeling at that point. Mostly, I was just feeling angry. I was just feeling so angry. That was the most prevalent emotion in my life at that time, and I was feeling very far away from God. Um, and then even the friend that I was going to that church service with was, you know, he was a good friend of mine. Um, but we had dated on and off for far too long, truth be told, trying to make it work, and it just wasn't working. And I, you know, we all been there. Um, but eventually, he eventually told me that uh, we were theologically incompatible, which <laughs> I know it was. I never, no one had ever told that to me before. But that pushed every rejection button in my body. So those of you who who know me pretty well might know that like one of my stuck points, one of those big things that like when I'm going to that deep dark place, I go to that place of you are not enough. And so him telling me that made me feel not enough in so many different ways, religiously, spiritually, psychologically, relationally. And so I was just feeling, you know, so just worn down and discouraged. And even earlier that day, I had gone to lab and this Christian psychologist had led this mindfulness meditation on, on a psalm actually on uh, using the Bible and, and using, focusing around this verse um, where you lay down your weapons, the idea of laying down your weapons. And so usually, you know, that would, I'd probably find that nice, relaxing, and, you know, very pleasant. But at that time, I was like, if one more white man tells me what to do to calm down, to be quiet, to be nice, to lay down your weapons, easy for you to say to lay down your weapons, sir. Like, no way. Um, I was not having it. Um, so usually, like, that would be nice, but I was very angry at this time. Uh, so I was like, if one more white man tells me what to do, I'm going to lose it. So... I don't know if anyone else relates to this kind of feeling in the world today. <laughs> feeling frustrated and angry with people, both individually and communally, with a, or a particular gender even, with the way it feels harder to speak up and be listened to and respected as a woman or even a human. But that's where I was at that night. And so I went to a church that night feeling very burned out and disconnected, shut down and angry and feeling very far away from God. So. I did not listen much to what the preacher was saying that night. 
Um, I was too busy being angry, but <laughs> as I was waiting in line for communion, an image popped into my mind, a phrase. And I still, I get emotional talking about this because it was such an impactful moment of that time of God entering into my reality and reorienting me in a way that I could not have expected. So the phrase, and God picked up her knitting needles and began to knit together the world, popped into my brain. I saw an image of God as mother sitting at a kitchen table by a warm hearth, knitting, picking up her knitting needles and sewing, uh, sewing creation into being, not just making sky and sea, but loving her children so much that she kept on knitting and knitting and creating more and more things and giving more and more to her children. And I started crying in the middle of the line for a communion because I just kept on thinking about how much I felt like the world had taken from me in that moment and also thinking of God pouring out good gifts for her children. And in that moment, I think that may have been the only way I could have had an authentic experience of God when I was so tired of masculine voices in my life that had been tearing me down, that I needed God to speak into my life in the only way I could hear her, as a mother, as a giver. So I wanna take this opportunity to talk about how great my mom is, because I love her so much and I think she's the best. So some of you guys might know Linda. Obviously I'm very biased, but I think she's the most incredible woman in the world. So um, she is just one of the most giving people I know. Like even this week when I was prepping for this sermon, you know, she would be like, oh, can I get you tea? Can I get you water? And before I'd even finished one glass of water, she was bringing me a whole new glass of ice water. And uh, you know, I'd come home from work and she'd be like, oh, can I get you food? And I'd be like, no, I'm fine, mom. Like I can make it for myself. You know, I'm 29, it'll be okay. <laughs> and, you know, but then she'd like two minutes later, she'd be like, oh, can I make you grilled cheese? Do you want me to go to the store and get you to something? Like, what can I get for you? Like probably literally 10 times in one night, she would be asking me, what can I do for you? What can I get for you? Um, and she is this way with everyone. You know, she takes time off of work to take my grandmother to her appointments, to her errands. Yesterday, um, I needed help moving furniture. Um, and she, <laughs> I like called her and she was in the middle of running errands and she left left her errand, she left Target to come meet me somewhere to help me move furniture. Um, and she, like, you know, when my sister had, like, a medical procedure, she went to New York and, like, spent the weekend with her, like, taking care of her. You know, my mom is just so inc incredibly selfless. She's someone who's not satisfied unless she's doing something for you, getting something for you, or giving something to you. And even when she's giving you something, she's often already asking what she can get you next. Um, in fact, for my birthday this year, my mom got me a bunch of really nice stuff, like some nice boots, a nice coat, and then also some nice little personal things like lotion for my car, because she knew I didn't have lotion in my car, and like K-cups, because I need coffee <laughs> at work, definitely. Um, and she said, like, even when she was giving it to me, she said, it always feels like it's never enough. And that's my mom, like, she's, she always feels like everything she gives, she just wants to give more. Um, so when I think of God as a giver, I think of my mom. When I feel drained and poured out and exhausted and am in need of comfort, I think of my mom. And so to me, in that moment at church, when I was feeling burned out and angry and at the end of my rope, God gave me a gift by coming to me as mother. So Sally McFay is a theologian who, in her book, Models of God, talks about the importance of metaphor in understanding God. So we're all familiar, uh, a lot of us are familiar with metaphors of God as King, Lord, Father. We hear a lot of those in our prayers and the songs that we sing. Um, that, those are very kind of classical metaphors for God. Um, but there's also a lot of biblical metaphors for God, including the ones that Sally McFay talks about such as mother, friend, and lover. And these are in the Bible, and, um, and when we do the prayers of the people today, you'll see some other metaphors for God that all come from Scripture. I promise I didn't make them up. They're all in the Bible. Um, so there's a biblical precedent for these metaphors, for this metaphor of, of God as mother. That's in the Bible, and it's a very Jewish way of thinking about God as well. Um, so the way that we view the God we worship changes how we view the world, our faith, and ourselves. So if we see God only as this remote king in the sky who is all powerful and all knowing and unreachable, who gives commands from his heavenly throne, we are missing out on so much of who God is and what our relationship with her can be like. Um, I remember my systematic theology professor talking to our class about classical views of God. It's called classical theism and it's actually more influenced by Greek thought than by Jewish thought, which you know, makes sense for Greek empire type thing. Um, and so, 
uh, my professor was asking us, what does this classical view of God remind you of? An all-powerful, all-knowing, emotionally remote, king in the sky. And we were like, oh, the patriarchy. Like, those are patriarchal values. Um, and so theologian D. Bloch summarizes the situation well. Much of the reinterpretation of the doctrine of God can be traced to a rising reaction against classical theism, the legacy of Hellenism, that's what I was talking about in terms of Greek thought, that has left an indelible imprint on Christian theology. Here, God is depicted as immutable, self-contained, all-sufficient, impassable, supremely detached from the world of pain, of of the world of pain and suffering. How can this kind of God be reconciled with the biblical God who earnestly cares for his people, even to the extent of taking their pain and guilt upon himself in the incarnation and atoning death of his son? So classical theism is something that I think a lot of us have internalized, even if we don't always realize it. I know that I have. Um, and so in a big way, this is part of why I think recognizing different metaphors and models of God can help us break free from the way systems of power have historically co-opted the loving God who is defined by her suffering with the oppressed. Viewing God through different metaphors can help us see more clearly the way God loves the world and more clearly the way God loves us. Now, I'm not saying get rid of God as father. I love my daddy, you guys know he's the best as well. Um, and we all have different relationships with our mothers and fathers that would make the metaphor of God as mother or father somewhat different for each and every one of us. That's why I shared my story of my mom the giver. For me, when I think of mother, I think of abounding generosity, utter selflessness, and overwhelming kindness. That's how my mom has showed God's love to me. So when I think of God as mother, I think of the God who never stops delighting in giving good gifts after good gifts to her children, who trips over her own feet to keep on giving. But again, that's not everyone's mom. And there are people who have tough and troubled relationships with their mothers or who might not have a relationship with their mother or never have known their mother. So that's the gift, I think, of metaphor, of the richness of language. There are so many ways to know God and to be known by God and our own human understanding is so limited, but God in her goodness and grace has given us the gift of language and metaphor to come to her and know her, even when the trials and tribulations of the world and the brokenness of our own human relationships have obscured her from our vision. In fact, I think one of the most powerful metaphors for God for me in my own life isn't even a human one. I love taking walks at night and I always feel very keenly connected to God in the night sky and there's something about that all enveloping peace and calm of night and darkness that makes me feel profoundly that I'm in the presence of the Holy One. So I wanna conclude by going back to this idea of orientation, disorientation, reorientation. As much as the world can be an ugly, scary place, we need those moments of orientation such as in Psalm 1 to tether us. That way, when we become disoriented, when the way we view the world is turned upside down on its head, when the worldview that the wicked always suffer and the righteous always flourish that we see in Psalm 1, which is just not the world we live in, no matter how badly we wish it was so, God comes to us and gives us the gift of reorientation. God comes to us like a mother and gives us a gift, not of our own making, but out of her steadfast and abounding love for us, showing us a world that is even better than the one we imagined. May it be so. Amen. Please stand for the